time to meet our next guest. And he is a television news heavyweight. In fact, one of the best news directors in the business, as well as being one of the top media trainers in the country. Delighted to welcome to the informer, news director and media commentator, Steve Carey. I don't know where to start. I, I thought we might touch on one of the things that has permeated our lives, other than the word unprecedented, and that is fake news. Yeah. yeah? Where do we start? By well, we start time? with President Trump because there was fake news around before. You and I have been around a long time. So the notion that news is not news is not new. But what has been new is that President Trump has used that as a whip and a whip against the media and the media that he doesn't want to engage with. So it's a really easy thing for the great unwashed to catch on to and go, oh, fake news, I don't like it. It's gotta be fake news. And that's very, very, very dangerous because what that does is it breaks the trust between the audience and the consumer and the person who is giving us that information and the media. So who do you trust? when it's easy for somebody, the arguably the most powerful man in the world to talk about fake news and people are actually having rallies now attacking media for doing their job, that's a very, very dangerous situation. The question I have for you, you know, you're one of the best news directors I've known, one of the toughest to come up against, one of the best media trainers in the business. We've got a crop of young stars, young men and women who are coming out as well trained as possible. Mm. How tough is this new news landscape for them? The, the, because they've got, to, they've got to look after us for the next 10, yeah. 20 years. I'll tell you how tough it is. When you and I started, or when I started, uh, I had to do one story. When mm. I started at Channel 9 in Brisbane decades ago, I was doing the police round. So my day started at five in the morning, go to the police conference at seven, go to wherever it happened to be, whether it was a murder or a car crash, do that head to the pub at midday, phone a story at one. All done. When I left running the news division at seven, I'll give you one example, Norm Beeman. We broke the story uh, in Glen Farda, right, of Tony Mockbell being arrested. Yes. Um, that's probably one of the highlights of my career, getting that. But on that day, Norm had to do not only Channel 7 Sunrise, then had to do the morning show, then had to do promos, had to do radio, had to do afternoon 4.30 news, back it up for six o'clock live cross, and then we still had today to night. That was unrelenting. And you look at any kids starting now, they not only have to have the smarts to get the story, they have to have the energy, the drive, the passion to go across a whole stack of different medium. And the stamina. Huh? And the stamina. And, and so the challenge for them is, they are being bombarded with information and news editors and producers and the audience, they want the information, they don't want it yesterday, they don't mm. want it in and out, they want it now. How do you make sure that your information is right? And I say, if I was still running the news, I would rather get it right and take the time to get it right than be the first to break it because the pressure on people to break stories, and I was one that used to flog that horse, we want an exclusive, we want it now. Don't give me BS results of near enough is good enough. We want it. And sometimes you make a mistake. The Boston, uh, uh, the, the two brothers uh, who committed the bombing at yep. the Boston Marathon, that was just such a case. There was information that was leaked early on by social media yep. and the vigilante groups were out there chasing a whole bunch of different people. Yep. And that story could have gone anywhere until it it, it ended up in the right place and they, they captured the two brothers. But there was great mayhem done uh, and the story just wouldn't stop. And it brought Boston to a standstill. We've all heard the saying, content is king or queen, whichever way you want to, want to say it. Touche, right? yeah. Um, so content is king, it's this voracious beast that has to be fed. What does news provide networks? I can tell you what news provides networks. It provides cheap content. Because if you look at what it costs to produce a high-end Netflix kind of show compared to what it costs to run an hour or two of news, we are talking, we're not talking sheep stations, mate, we're talking a little shed in the backyard. Correct. And so programmers look at that, network bosses look at that, and they say, hey, no big deal, we can keep running a news cycle. We can keep you know, feeding that beast. And that's the danger, is when do we get some downtime? A, as journalists, to reflect on what we're doing, Secondly, to make sure our information is absolutely spot on before deadline. And thirdly, that it's credible. And that is my big, big, big driver. It's got to be credible. So when I look at news, 
I don't just go to one source. I don't go to one place and go, oh, that suits me, that aligns with what I want. I deliberately, and I would say to your audience and the people who are going to watch this, go to different sources, graze on many different media mm. outlets. That way you will get the whole menu, you won't just get dessert. And, and what happens when you only go down one track is it, it is the return of ever diminishing information. And, and it's coloured. It's coloured by whichever pathway or Absolutely. channel you've chosen. Absolutely. I can remember in the early days of, of SBS when we launched, uh, we would get the satellite, the first satellite, there were two satellites for the day. One came at 11 o'clock, the other one at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. The 11 o'clock came out of London, yep. and that was the sum total of stories we'd get out of uh, London. Yep. And at 1 o'clock came the uh, Los Angeles, and that gave us the whole rest of the day then, not to go out and have a coffee or a lunch, although some did, <laughs> but to actually square away those stories and have them complete. Complete by the time we went to air. So we actually had a full bulletin of full stories. Yep. What we have to fast forward to today, and there may well be one or two stories put away, good to go, mm. and the rest are all developing pieces. Mm. So the person on the desk knows very little, Everything is dependent on the reporter, who also is being shunned and being held back from actually getting the full, the full story. And as we saw during this recent tragedy where four policemen lost their lives, when a car was pulled over and then a truck driver, uh, we, still, we still don't know what's transpired. No. But that story took on five or six different lives before we finally got some understanding of what had transpired that evening. Well, the, there are a couple of things that come into play there. One, as I've said, is the fast nature of news. Correct. So you need to be able to step back. So what you need to, it's not, you know what, it's not just the young journos. You can't put it all on just the young journos. You've got to have people still in the game with just more than skin in the game. You've got to have people who are experienced enough and tough enough to push back the higher ups that say, I want it now. And I'm not just talking news directors and news editors, I'm talking holistically in the media at the moment. You need people who've got the experience to say, this is a great story, I want to run it, but I'm just going to take the breath, a single breath, to make sure it is right. Because when we started, the tenet of journalism was to make sure that everyone was covered. Correct. We were taught there were two sides to every story. Now we don't know, and it's before the courts, on that one that you're citing, so we can't go there, and that will play out rightly before Correct. the court. As it should. As it should. So we don't want vigilante journalism. We want truthful, or at least I don't, I want truthful, honest, impartial journalism. Now when I started the but other that takes thing, time, Steve. Yeah, but, but it also takes courage. Mm -hmm. And it takes courage from people above. It's not just enough to say to some poor kid coming out of college who's, who's never been led or guided to say, hey, go and do this, jump the fence, do that. We still have to abide by, if we're going to be trusted and condemn fake news, we can't be partly guilty of it. Look, I concur with everything you've said. Here's the challenge. This is the greatest time of turmoil that the media world has seen. All those great champions of freedom and uh, you know, clear speech have long gone. Yeah? And who owns the media units? Who owns the media today? Can the, they afford, I'll tell you who, George, can they afford I'll to I'll tell run? you who owns it to finish up. The people own it if we're smart enough to do it right and ask the right questions. And support the media that should be supported. That's where we're going to get to and that's who owns it. Steve Carey, we've barely scratched the surface. Promise me we can do this again on The Informer. Absolutely. Right. Look forward to it.